Good morning, and you're very welcome to today's Signpost webinar. My name is Mark Gibson, and I'm the manager of the Chagas Connected program. I hope you're keeping safe and well wherever you're enjoying uh, today. And uh, today's Signpost webinar series is brought to you in association with the National Rural Network, Food Drink Ireland, and the Dairy Sustainability Ireland. So today we're going to switch our focus back on water quality and where we're going to look at is the impact of pesticides on our water quality and the initiatives that farmers and industry are rolling out to tackle this issue. And I'm delighted to be joined by John Kyo, who is Chief Executive of Animal and Plant, the Plant Health Association. Uh, John, good morning to you. Very welcome. Good morning, Mark. And we're also joined by Pat Murphy, who is our Head of uh, Knowledge Transfer and the Environment Department. Pat, good morning to you. Morning, Mark. So, John, uh, welcome again. Uh, John, you're with the Animal and Plant Health Association. Can you tell us a bit about the, uh, the association and what it does? Yeah, sure, Mark. Uh, so the Animal and Plant Health Association represents the uh, manufacturers and distributors of plant protection products and animal health uh, remedies or veterinary medicines uh, in Ireland. And you've been taking a very active role uh, from an industry perspective on water quality and the impact of pesticides. And you're going to be talking to us about that this morning, in particular, the, the TOPS program. Maybe you could just uh, give us some context to that. Yeah, the uh, TOPS program is a European initiative. It has been going for a, a number of years. Uh, and it stands for training operators to protect uh, water sources and ensure sustainability. Uh, we as Animal and Plant Health Association are connected into the European network. And so we have access to the uh, TOPS program. Uh, we have had some TOPS training sessions, as you probably be aware, in, in Ireland uh, two years ago. Now we had intended to do more. Uh, but we fell victim to the uh, curtailments of last year. But we ran events uh, aimed at the advisory community, uh, three locations uh, in 2019. Brilliant. OK, John. Well, look, uh, I know you have a lot to, to, to share with us this morning. So if I could ask you to, to share your screen and uh, we can go through your presentation. And to remind everybody, if you have a question for John, you can use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Um, uh, we have a really... Uh, healthy looking audience numbers this morning, John. So uh, we will talk to you after your presentation. Great, well, thanks, Mark. Um, so as you mentioned, uh, I hope I haven't got too many slides. Uh, so I'm now in a position where I'm probably going to gallop through them and we'll be finished in 10 minutes, but I'll try not to do that. So a uh, title for this morning's discussion is uh, Low Impact Weed Control, uh, Protecting Drinking Water. So uh, talking about uh, low impact in the context of uh, water as opposed to uh, low impact in the context of weed control. Uh, what I would hope to do uh, this morning is to look at the challenge we face uh, and put it in some context. Uh, we look at the limits and the consequences around uh, drinking water and chemistry. Uh, look at the scope and impact of best practice uh, with particular reference to point source emissions. So I'll divide between uh, point source and diffuse, and I'll cover that. Um, and look at the uh, risk mitigation that's possible with the, in the context of point source emissions. I'll finish up by briefly discussing catchment monitoring, the program that AFA have been running for the past three years uh, in conjunction with other stakeholders as part of the National Pesticide and Drinking Water Action Group. Uh, and then we can come maybe to some questions and discussion uh, at the end. So first of all, let's look at some of the challenges uh, that are out there. So one that comes to mind uh, readily is rush control and grassland. So as we know, rushes are a problem, particularly in um, less intensive grassland uh, or margin, marginal grassland. And these photographs were taken uh, three years ago now uh, at an event uh, organized by Kieran Kenny and Chagas uh, up in one of the catchments when we looked at different uh, methods of dealing with rushes in grassland. So on the left-hand side, you see uh, a tractor and mulcher being used, uh, so physical removal of the rushes. Centre, we have traditional uh, spraying, boom sprayer, uh, and on the right-hand side, uh, a weed licker 
uh, which is relatively newer uh, technology in terms of application of herbicides uh, to grassland. These four photographs, I, I didn't include a photograph of topping, which was the other uh, treatment that we looked at. These four photographs were taken of that same patch of ground uh, divided into four sections uh, before any treatments. So before topping on the top left-hand side, uh, before mulching on the top right, and then on the bottom left before spraying, and on the bottom right before weed licking, just to demonstrate that the challenge uh, faced by each of the treatments was equal uh, across uh, those selected patches. So the treatments were applied and we came back uh, nine months later on the 1st of March and took photographs of the same uh, patches. And you can see here that where we topped or the ground that was topped, the rushes have re-established. Equally in the uh, mulched ground, the, the rushes have re-established. And then on the right-hand side, we have the two chemical applications. So weed licking here where we see some re-establishment of rushes and in this photograph here on the um, center right is the sprayed ground uh, with, that was sprayed with MCPA. So you can see it's quite effective. And from a farmer perspective, a, probably the most effective treatment uh, in terms of rush control. And there are reasons underlying uh, those results, uh, particularly if we look at weed licking, it's the application of total herbicide uh, selectively to the standing uh, crop that you want to manage. And so it doesn't connect with uh, the smaller plants uh, and younger rushes and they continue to grow. Uh, spraying, as we know, is a, an overall application and the physical applications of effectively mowing and uh, mulching allow the, the rushes to re-establish. So that's the context uh, of grassland treatment uh, with uh, selective herbicide for rush control. Uh, this slide is taken from a presentation given by the EPA and I just put it up so that we put a context on what's going on with drinking water. There is a European directive uh, on drinking water. It has recently been um, reviewed and the published in the latter part of last year. And the limits have remained the same. So there's no change to the limits. And those limits are uh, 0.1 micrograms per litre of pesticide, of an individual pesticide in drinking water. So a limit of 0.1 microgram per litre. Uh, there are two other limits which are probably less relevant, but one is for total pesticides, which is 0.5 micrograms per litre. And then for these older pesticides, uh, there's a much lower limit set. But in reality, I've never seen an exceedance of those. They're no longer used um, for many years, so it's probably not relevant. But this top one here is the is the limit uh, that we're working towards uh, with regard to individual uh, pesticides. Now, again, <clears throat> this is uh, from that same presentation. These EU limits are not health-based. Um, and to put that in context, if you look at the WHO, the World Health Organization, uh, it sets guideline values uh, based on health risk. And it's set for some, but not all active uh, ingredients. It is set for MCPA. And in the case of MCPA, the WHO limit is 7,000 times higher than the EU limit contained in the Drinking Water Directive. And that's just to emphasize that we are working to an extremely uh, low target uh, based on the Drinking Water Directive, and it's not health-based. John, can you clarify just what, what is it based on or why, why are they, those significantly lower than the WHO uh, guideline values? Yeah, this next slide might actually do that, Mark. This is from the same presentation, uh, but given by the Department of Agriculture, uh, and it elaborates what the limit actually re reflects. And you can see here in the third point that uh, it's again referenced to not being a health-based standard. And they, it was described as a political decision from the 1980s to use 0.1 parts per billion uh, as a surrogate for zero. So effectively, it's, it's the lowest level of detection that was possible when the limit was set and set at zero, so zero tolerance. 
what it means in practical terms, uh, and I've some difficulty getting my head around billions, although we hear a lot about them in the context of our exchequer figures, uh, 0.1 microgram per litre is 0.1 part parts per billion. So uh, one part in 10 billion. Uh, so some practical examples of what that might look like, it's equivalent to one drop in an Olympic sized swimming pool of 375,000 litres, one stem in 111,000 hay bales or a baked bean in 21 million cans, or indeed one second in 317 years. So that's the limit. Uh, it's very low, it's not health-based, but it is the limit and it is the limit that uh, drinking water must conform to. So why is there an issue, and particularly in the context of phenoxy acids and more specifically uh, MCPA? If you take the foil seal on a five litre can of um, MCPA, there's enough active ingredient on that if it comes in contact with a stream uh, to put the stream over the limit for a stretch of 30 kilometers. So that is the issue uh, that we're dealing with uh, minute quantities having the capacity to put waterways over the limit over extended uh, stretches. Um, again, there is an issue because we have seen uh, through the Irish water uh, sampling program exceedances of the 0.1 micrograms per litre. Uh, and those exceedances uh, drive focus on the catchments that are feeding into those um, extraction facilities for drinking water. So what we have to look at it from first principles is we have a source, which is the pesticide or the herbicide or the weed killer. Um, we have a pathway, which is either uh, directly or indirectly through ground, land, overland or through land to a receptor being a water body. Uh, and that's what creates the problem. Uh, MCPA and phenoxy acids are very mobile in uh, water. They're very soluble in water. Uh, and so they have the capacity once co in contact with water to travel over extended periods. Now in Ireland, we have for um, historical reasons, a public network of supplies, uh, which uh, equates with 883 individual uh, supplies. And that's very extensive. Um, so at 883 points around the country, we are extracting water uh, for the purpose of public supply. And 80% of those are coming from surface water. That's very different to what happens in other European countries. Uh, in the Netherlands, for, an exam for example, there are nine extraction points. And that brings us to the next challenge, and that is that pesticides are difficult to remove by treatment, they, by water treatment. They can be removed. Uh, carbon uh, filtration is very effective to remove MCPA from water, but it's an expensive capital cost uh, to install the facilities and a running cost in terms of the carbon uh, filters uh, that makes it prohibitively expensive uh, for Irish water to install, certainly at 883 locations around the country. So if we take that this, we have sources over here, whether that's amateur use on the left-hand side and gardens or professional amenity use on golf courses or playing fields, or whether it's farming activities, uh, application on grassland. If it gets into water, water is extracted, uh, it's not treated to remove uh, the MCPA and it gets into the distribution networks. Uh, this slide here uh, looks just at the monitoring of drinking water over time in Ireland. And you see the red dotted line. Prior to that, the individual responsibility for monitoring drinking water was with the local authorities who were involved in the supply, public supplies. Then in 2013, Irish Water was established and Irish Water have put together a very comprehensive national program uh, of monitoring uh, against the uh, limits. And when that program was put in place, we instantly saw an increase uh, in the uh, detections, not because there was an increase in the level of exceedances, but there was a better detection system in place. 
So you see they rise up here to uh, the number of public supplies over being over 60 impacted in 2015 out of the 883. And then what happens after that is, is interesting because if you look at the trend here, we see on the right hand side, the, there is a decline uh, in the exceedances being recorded. And that's as a result of the increased focus and the activities uh, to manage uh, the use of the chemistry and carefully manage the catchments. So if I go to 2018, what was being detected, the three quarters of what was being detected in, in water exceedances was MCPA. That's 2018. If I roll forward uh, to this chart, which is the current, our 2020, you see that that proportion has dropped to just over 50%. Indeed, if I went back prior to 2018, 85% of the exceedances would have been accounted for by MCPA. So it's not that MCPA is particularly uh, problematic uh, in the context of uh, as, a, as a pesticide, but it is a problematic from the perspective of it traveling through water not being removed in uh, treatment and the proportion of exceedances that it was accounting for. But as we can see, there's progress being made. This um, was from a recent update to the uh, National Pesticide and Drinking Water Action Group. And it shows, as you can see here, the number of exceedances uh, dropping from 2016, 137 um, down to 80 to 90 exceedances which is positive progress and also the number of supplies dropping from 44 down to uh, 27 in 2019. Although there was an increase last year, both in exceedances and supplies that we're not sure why, but we do know that uh, glyphosate has become um, higher uh, in terms of the number of uh, exceedances recorded. And that may reflect activity related to uh, lockdown and um, people being overly zealous maybe about maintaining uh, hard surfaces. So if that's the problem uh, and, that's, and you see progress, uh, how do we impact on reducing the uh, exceedances that are present in raw water being taken for treatment and supply through the public network? And that brings us to best practice management, uh, which is what TOPS is all about. And in terms of reducing losses of plant protection products to water, it is a multi-stakeholder approach. Uh, it's about diagnosing the problem, identifying the issues and adapting uh, measures uh, to ensure that we remove uh, the risk of the chemistry finding its way or escaping uh, to water courses. So information and training of farmers and other stakeholders is very much part of what we do. And looking at a holistic uh, water protection concept at the catchment or field level. So looking at all the routes uh, and sources and pathways that the chemistry can find its way in, into water. And then promoting that uh, in official training and support programs. So you can see here uh, in the bottom right, we have best management practices, the operators who are those who are actually applying the chemistry and better equipment. And of course we see, we see uh, with sprayer equipment inspections and approvals uh, an increasing uh, performance of the uh, spraying equipment uh, over time. The main entry points for plant protection products to surface water are grouped into point sources and diffuse uh, sources. The diffuse sources come from the fields. They include drainage and runoff, and they can be reduced. The point sources are related primarily to the farmyard and the handling and preparation and cleaning of equipment, and they actually can be avoided. So if we concentrate on point sources, we can eliminate that as a, as a route of entry uh, for the chemistry. Uh, to water, not ignoring diffuse, uh, but concentrating on maybe the lower hanging fruit. 
this is a chart. The detail of this is not important. It's an example taken from Sweden and it's quite old, but what it demonstrates, the red bars demonstrate are the exceedances uh, and the concentrations in micrograms per liter of those exceedances. Uh, and what happened when uh, advice coupled with better equipment and better operations was put in place here and we see a significant reduction uh, over time. So it does work. Best practice uh, does work. And we know from work that was done actually by Kieran Kenny in, in Chagas uh, that farmers are concerned about water quality um, and they want to do the right thing. So we have a, a group who are involved in the application of the chemistry who want to do the right thing, want to protect water, and that's a good place to start. In terms of uh, implementing the best practice and awareness, uh, there are various ways to do that. And this is uh, work done on the average retention rate of messages delivered using different um, types of delivery. So we see here, lecture and I guess what we're talking about this morning uh, has a retention rate which is actually quite low of five percent. If we move down, if people read the information it'll increase, if they see it audio, audio visually it will increase, if we get to demonstrations we get to 30 percent retention. Uh, discussion groups which are um, two-way will increase that to 50 percent practice by doing to 75% and teaching or qualifying to teach others uh, will increase the retention rate to 90%. So we can see that we go from being able to reach many uh, through lectures, uh, but with a lower retention rate to being able to reach few uh, through interpersonal interaction, but with a much higher retention rate. And the challenge for TOPS is to get the information that's there established from other uh, research down through uh, this process so that it gets down to those who can actually make a difference, those who are applying uh, the chemistry. So avoiding risks uh, from um, of PPP loss to water the higher risks uh, are around sprayer cleaning, uh, mixing and loading sprayers, uh, remnant management, and then empty container disposal. And as you go beyond that, there are other risks such as transport from the yard to the field, uh, storage on the farm, and transport of the chemistry to the farm, which are lower risks. So we'll concentrate on sprayer uh, cleaning. We know from research that in terms of rinsing, there are varying practices out there. So this is when the sprayer is used, there's a residue in the sprayer, what happens? 11% said no rinsing, 38% gave the sprayer one rinse, 39% two rinses, and 11% triple rinsing. Triple rinsing takes time and it's inconvenient, and therefore we have to assume that it doesn't always occur. But it is required in order to uh, manage the chemistry. Triple rinsing, if there's a, a facility within the sprayer, involves uh, taking a third of the uh, clean water, uh, introducing it into the empty tank, agitating it and spraying it out on the ground that you've been working on, taking the second third and the third, th the third uh, uh, 30%, and then you get to remarkably clear water. We have demonstrated this using a demonstration sprayer, uh, which I'll uh, show you later, uh, but this is what's required. It's not easy, but it does uh, remove the residues from the sprayer. Uh, dumping of undiluted residual spray is a high risk. Uh, so letting that off to a drain uh, without thinking about where that drain goes or dumping it onto a hard surface, which will inevitably, inevitably find its way to a drain and subsequently to water courses. So that must never be done. Uh, sprayers must never be rinsed onto a hard surface, gravel or um, 
concrete and certainly residual spray must never be allowed to access drainage. The other aspect related to the sprayer is the external surfaces. So when one is operating in the field, some of the spray will find its way onto the spur, um, onto the boom, it will dry and you get resi residues there. Rinsing the outside of the sprayer immediately after use uh, will be the most effective way to clean that. 97.5% of residues were removed with 25, 25 litres of water when it's done immediately after um, operation. If you allow that to dry, that same amount of water will only remove 70% of the residues. And indeed, if you look at it the other way, after 10 hours, you would need five times more washing to actually get the residual sprays off. So don't bring the sprayer back, park it up on a hard surface in the yard and allow the rain, subsequent rain to wash the residues off, wash it in the field. When it comes to containers, uh, how many of us have seen examples of this? Hopefully not recently, uh, but poor management of empty containers is a high risk. They need to be cleaned, triple rinsed, stored properly and disposed of properly. And triple rinsing, if you don't have a hopper, an induction hopper on the sprayer, requires you to one third fill the container, close it, shake it, empty it into the sprayer. Repeat that three times. It's the same routine for the, for the sprayer as it is for the container. When they're triple rinsed, they can then be fed into the uh, farm plastics recycling scheme uh, where they are deemed to be non-hazardous waste. Don't forget the caps uh, and, the, and the seals. Uh, put the whole lot when it's triple rinsed uh, into a storage and take it to the farm film plastics recycling scheme where the farm plastics recycling is collected uh, in half ton bags. In the meanwhile, store those empty containers carefully, uh, store them under cover uh, in bags um, and do not burn them or bury them. Uh, that is not acceptable practice. When you're filling sprayers, it's a ne necessity to um, not fill them uh, from directly from a water course. So don't drop the induction tube into a water course. That is really high risk. Uh, and if you're filling from a tap, don't allow the hose to dip into the uh, spray tank. Keep a separation between the hose and the water source and the actual water in the sprayer tank. And pay attention to the process. Uh, don't leave the tap running, go off, have a cup of coffee, do something else and come back and find this scenario where here you see the sprayer is overfilled uh, and run over the sides and here you see residues in the yard. So no other activities are, dis are distractions, concentrate, this is important work uh, that needs your full concentration. So it becomes a cycle. Uh, so the cycle includes transport of, of plant protection products, the storage of them, uh, filling of the sprayer, the spraying activity, washing up afterwards, managing the um, remnants and also the containers. And so when you complete that cycle, uh, that is the best management practice uh, in order to keep the chemistry doing what you want it to do and away from water. Needless to say, never overspray water bodies uh, and don't spray onto hard surfaces. And this is important because it's not just farm roadways, but you will see increasingly uh, drainage stone brought to the surface uh, in grassland. And where it's brought to the surface, it becomes a direct uh, route for chemistry if it's applied uh, to get to the water course. And we have even seen examples of strip spraying of those uh, drains where stone is brought to the surface, presumably to prevent growth uh, ingressing into the stone. But when you think about it, you're spraying onto a surface that is uh, non-porous, will not absorb, and the water uh, subsequent water movements will take that directly to water courses. 
Uh, buffer zones are mandatory. Uh, they're not just about streams. They're a legal requirement for every water course, and you need to observe the buffer zone. It's uh, on every can uh, of product, and it's uh, five meters step back from all water courses. Uh, there's lots of information available uh, for users. There's literature such as this, particularly focused on protecting drinking water from pesticides and herbicide use in grassland. Collaborative uh, publications supported by the Department of Agriculture, ourselves, EPA, Chagask, and HSE, and various other uh, stakeholders. So everyone bought into these practices, uh, and these leaflets are available. Uh, if you need them, you can contact me. We have other, uh, as part of the TOPS program, support materials, which are more in-depth. Uh, we don't have that in this, those in the same quantity, but they are available to advisors, uh, covering aspects of pesticide management, including runoff, point sources, uh, drainage, and leaching. And this is the uh, demonstration sprayer that I mentioned uh, to you earlier. Uh, we use this for demonstrating uh, both the impact of different nozzles, but more importantly, in this context, the impact of rinsing uh, and washing the sprayer. Um, so we can visually see using food dye, how the concentration uh, diminishes over time. This unit is on uh, loan to the teaching facility in Kildalton uh, at the moment. Uh, suppliers of the chemistry also invest in campaigns uh, focused completely on protecting waterways from contamination. This is a, a campaign of a couple of years back uh, where these posters just listed the simple instructions to users uh, to, uh, in order to protect the chemistry. And these are farmer demonstrations uh, which we would participate in uh, where farmers come together to see uh, grasslands that need treatment and see the impact and hear the impact uh, and the best management practice uh, associated with uh, spraying, weed licking and other treatments. I said I'd mention uh, monitoring. Uh, so three years ago, we commenced a monitoring program uh, in the four catchments identified by the EPA as being on the remedial action list. And those are catchments that had seen uh, a number four or greater exceedances in the prior year uh, in drinking water. Uh, the four catchments were the Nor uh, in Kilkenny, the Field and Deal in West Limerick, and Loch Forbes in Longford. And we started monitoring uh, those in April of 2018. And we monitored weekly and fortnightly throughout the growing season. Uh, from April to October. Uh, we had a total of 55 monitoring points. So we end up with a large data set of 1100 recorded sampling events. Uh, the purpose of that was to aid diagnose, diagnose, diagnosis um, so that we could identify areas that were particularly problematic, or indeed we could potentially identify uh, individual sources uh, of uh, exceedances. They're also about awareness raising, uh, because when we're monitoring in those catchments, uh, it's known that we're monitoring in those catchments, uh, and it raises the awareness of A, there being a problem, and B, uh, the need to adopt best practice. We couple those with stewardship, uh, so farmer interaction, um, both through talks, discussions, uh, the provision of information and uh, campaigns, and also demonstrations in conjunction with other stakeholders, uh, including uh, Chagask, and many of those events are actually led by Chagask. And through those, we try to disseminate some of the messages I've been talking about around best practice management, uh, with the intention of improving the um, management uh, of pesticides in those areas. And I'm happy to report that we have seen some progress. Uh, the NOR and the uh, FEEL are no longer on the remedial action list. And that means they have had 12 months, uh, 12 continuous months uh, without an exceedance. 
So that demonstrates that with interventions and with the dissemination of knowledge and against the background that I talked about earlier, where farmers are concerned about water and want to do the right thing, it is possible uh, to make a difference. And it is therefore possible to preserve uh, the availability of the chemistry uh, for the treatment of particular products where it's uh, effective for landowners. With regard to the deal and the and Loch Forbes, we have made slower progress and they remain on the uh, remedial action list and a lot of our focus uh, is in the uh, Loch Forbes area uh, currently. So, uh, Mark, that was all I planned to uh, present this morning. Thank you very much, John. Um, really, and, and thanks for staying on time as well. Uh, you got through an awful lot there in a short space of time, so we do appreciate that. Um, if you could stop sharing your screen there with us, um, we can uh, maybe just have a look. Yeah, that's much better. Um, so um, we have lots of questions coming through, and just to remind people, do if you do have a question for John, use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, and we'd be delighted to put those questions to John. We have some questions in, but do keep them coming through to us. Uh, John, I suppose, I mean, anytime we, we, we talk about pesticides or we hear mention of pesticides in the media, it's usually in a, a negative uh, connotation that, you know, that's the, the negative impacts of pesticides. But can I put it to you, you know, what, what would the world look like without pesticides? Um, you know, because we, a lot of people you would hear say, arguing that we don't need pesticides. Uh, maybe get your perspective on that. Yeah, that's a rather broad question, uh, Mark, and I suppose we probably need to... I think to... It's, it's worth actually highlighting it, because yeah. we, we, we do, you know, we need to address it at the same time. Yeah, so the term pesticides is usually uh, accepted to embrace insecticides uh, for the management of insect pests, uh, herbicides for the management of uh, plants or weeds, um, and uh, fungicides for the management of uh, diseases. And... The chemistry across those three categories has been developed across the last, I guess, hundred years. We'll say there were, were some, there was some usage of it prior to that, uh, but it really developed in the last hundred years. And what it does, and what it has allowed, is the world to uh, feed or support a much uh, larger population. So if you go back to uh, 1900, population of the world. Um, was I think around a, a billion people uh, and today it's a factor of seven or eight times that um, and that is what uh, progress what agriculture uh, what pesticides within that has allowed if you removed uh, pesticides instantly uh, you would not be able to support the, the world's population today so that they are necessary and I think everyone accepts that um, they are highly regulated. In the case of Europe, we have a regulation which is, some of you may be familiar with, 1107-2009, uh, which regulates the uh, process of approving um, active substances at a European level and authorizing them at a local level in combination with uh, other act actives. But that's a very rigorous system. Uh, it looks not just at the efficacy of the products, but it looks at the uh, toxicology, the ecotoxicology. Uh, it looks at the um, metabolites uh, of the chemistry. So when they're used, what they turn into. Uh, and the process of registering uh, a, a new active substance is now longer than 10 years and costs approximately 250 million euros. To, do, to provide the evidence to support uh, a registration of an active substance. So it's a very rigorous system. I think they can tend to be um, maligned. Um, so if you think about what we started the discussion with, the limit that's set uh, is not a health-based limit. It's a, as I think described in that Department of Agriculture slide, a political uh, limit the health base limit is much higher. So if we adopted the WHO uh, advice, and WHO is quite a conservative organization, if we adopted that advice uh, for the uh, purpose of drinking water and pesticides 
we wouldn't have a problem. Uh, now, we don't, that's not something we campaign for or push for. We accept that there is a limit. Uh, we accept that the limit is not likely to change. And we accept that what we need to do is to um, use the products uh, and ensure that drinking water meets uh, the very stringent limit that's there. John, we have a question with just in relation to the, uh, the focus uh, of farmer training versus, uh, versus I suppose, non-farmers. Uh, person saying here that if we look at sales of uh, non-professional users purchasing uh, approximately 17% of pesticides, uh, I'm not sure, maybe you can comment on the accuracy of that, but how can we combat the narrative that farmers are the only or the main problem? And the same could be said for livestock and tillage farmers. Tillage farmers are seen as... Uh, with sprayers most often, but the exceedances reported are usually MCPA or glyphosate in those non-tillage non areas. So a few, a few different dimensions to that question. Okay, so uh, I'll take it in two sections and I'll deal with the latter one first. Um, why does it, why are we talking about grassland chemistry here rather than um, cereal or tillage uh, usage? So what I'll say to that is that all of the public supplies that we mentioned, the whole 100 or 883 are monitored. And that gives the guidance as to where the issues are arising. So if there were issues arising in the tillage sector, they would be flagged uh, through that monitoring program. So what we're reflecting is, if you go back to the pie chart I showed, so the 75% of the exceedance has been uh, MCPA, that's where we focus our effort, and that's grassland chemistry. And it tends to be primarily used in, I hope I'm not offending anyone, we say marginal land, uh, where those rushes are a, a, a greater problem. Mm -hmm. So that's what's driving this program. It's not that we don't look at um, tillage products, it's not that we don't look at tillage areas, it's where the problems are identified uh, and arise. To go back to the first part, um, Yes, MCPA is not uniquely used by farmers, and indeed your average lawn feed and weed uh, product will probably contain MCPA in many cases uh, because it's a selective herbicide. So it will kill the broadleaf uh, weeds in your lawn uh, without killing the grass, uh, as it kills rushes without killing the grass. Um, we are aware of that. Uh, we're increasingly including and focusing that. I think I mentioned the amenity sector uh, both professional amenity, so golf courses, uh, playing fields would be substantial users of, of this chemistry as well, and households. And I think that's uh, particularly important that householders get the messages um, that what they're putting on their lawn uh, may be equally capable of causing an issue uh, when compared with uh, what farmers are using to treat uh, grassland. We will have a better understanding of the uh, proportions because the Department of Agriculture are currently working on a study uh, of the market in terms of how much is being used uh, on um, or with amenity. But I will say that the amenity sector um, was booming last year. So garden centres, DIY, all those sectors all boomed on the back of uh, lockdown. So we tended to spend more of our time, leisure time, tending to our gardens and greater usage may actually be a factor in that slight increase we saw um, that I mentioned in 2020. So the amenity sector is not uh, ignored. Uh, it's, it's part of the uh, problem and part of the potentially part of the solution as well. Okay, John, we, we thank you for that. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in here now. So if maybe I could ask you to, to maybe be concise in your responses because it just in order to get to as many uh, questions as possible. Uh, Pass, I'll hand over to yeah. you for questions. Well, a, a quick one to start with. Uh, the, there's a quest, couple of questions around the training courses and the availability of, of the materials. I suppose the first question was, was, were the training courses available to all ag advisors and are the materials, course materials that were used in that uh, available? And I, you said, you showed us, I think, a slide of a number of uh, brochures, are they available online for people to, to pull down? 
Yeah, so the answer to the first question is the programme was made available to all advisors when it ran. We didn't run it last year because of, of the challenges we were faced with. Increasingly, these things move online and the resources are available. So if you want to collate uh, a list, uh, I'll try and address those with uh, disseminating the information. Okay. Uh, there's a few questions around the, the trial that you showed and, and whether or not there was, was uh, any follow-up afterwards, whether uh, um, going back a second year either with weed liquor or with, with manual cultivation uh, uh, increased the, the impact or is it, was it still short? And I, I say, I don't know if you actually went back to the same area again a second no, year. No, we didn't, uh, Pat. So I just have that uh, nine-month time frame on that. Okay, a few questions in relation to, I suppose, not just the impact of the, the pesticides on water quality, but looking at soil uh, biome and is there any, uh, or what in, information have you uh, in relation to impacts on, on soil uh, as opposed to, to drinking water or is it something that, that there is work being done on? I think that's something there's work being done on all the time at research level, our focus is on water because of the requirements to meet the drinking water limit. Uh, uh, the, uh, I suppose another question in there about uh, the, the potential levels of pesticide residues in food, is it something that emerges in Ireland or is it something uh, that we need to be concerned about? Uh, there's an ongoing program uh, looking at pesticide residues uh, in food, both produced locally and imported. It's run by the Department of Agriculture and it's reported every year. And uh, I can't remember offhand the uh, levels of compliance, but they're exceptionally high. John, the, the farm to fork strategy um, question here is saying that there's a 50% reduction in pesticides uh, uh, sought by 2030. What would you like to see in any impact assessment uh, of this? So I suppose look, the question here really is, you know, how 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 realistic is that uh, reduction uh, target? Yeah. Do you believe? Um, industry have concerns about the targets in terms of how they were set uh, and the and the possible impact of of those targets. So in a short answer, uh, we are, we understand there was no impact assessment done at European level on what the targets might, or the impacts of the targets might be. Uh, when we asked for that, as an industry, we were told that the is unlikely to be because they're not regulatory um, initiatives, uh, in which case Europe would do a regulatory impact assessment. So we as industry at a European level have commissioned Wageningen uh, in the Netherlands to look at what the impact of um, these uh, proposals in the, in the strategies might be. And I think in, within Chagask, there is some work being done on particular sectors to uh, try and identify from data banks that are there uh, what the impacts might be. The first reference I heard was uh, in the dairy sector where the fertilizer target was looked at. And it was estimated uh, by your colleagues in Chagas that that would result in a 10% uh, reduction in uh, farm profitability. Uh, more practical question here, um, John, in relation to cleaning weed liquors after use, particularly the sock or carpet type machine. Quite a technical question there. Uh, that's probably a technical question that I might pass on. Uh, okay. The one thing I will just say about weed liquors is, I, and I should have said this, uh, MCPA and phenoxy acids are not authorised for use in weed liquors. So weed liquors should only be used with um, glyphosate as a total herbicide, and then you rely on non-contact with the grass uh, in order to selectively uh, kill the rushes. Very good. Um, question here in relation to the, the, the focus on, on MCPA and, and where it's found, but if we kind of focus uh, very heavily on MCA, is there a possibility that we will just push the, the usage of other uh, uh, pesticides that maybe have an equivalent level of, of, of potential problems? Yeah, that risk has been spoken about, Pat, so, and it shouldn't be viewed as, well, we'll stop using MCPA and we'll uh, switch to 2,4-D, uh, for example, because that will just replace one uh, with the other. It's more about uh, adopting 
the best practice to try and uh, eliminate the risks uh, surrounding using uh, chemistry in grassland. Uh, the question there in relation to a kind of lag times and sources of, of MCPA where maybe exceedances have been found but uh, not necessarily linked to recent spray events. Uh, has there, uh, I suppose, what is the knowledge base in relation to the possibility of that happening? Um, there's a lot of work being done uh, with regard to how MCPA or phenoxy acids uh, behave uh, in uh, soils and in uh, water. So we, what we know is that the half-life of MCPA uh, is relatively short in aerobic conditions. So it's a matter of days in aerobic conditions. Uh, but in anaerobic conditions, the half-life is greatly extended. So the work that's been done is looking at potential um, capture of phenoxy acids in silts and sediments and in water bodies, uh, where in anaerobic conditions, so in the absence of oxygen, uh, it will remain. And then it maybe is released uh, at, due to subsequent events, be they weather events, rainfall events, or otherwise. What I will say is that we did a, and this is not scientific, um, and so not scientifically robust, but we did continue monitoring across the winter period in Loch Forbes, uh, in the Loch Forbes catchment for the past two years. So across the months of uh, November, December, January, February, and March, when we can be reasonably assured that there are no um, applications of the chemistry to grassland. And we use that as an indicator of whether the exceedances we see are from contemporary use or from legacy use. And that work suggests that we, I think we saw one exceedance in, the, in November of both years and no exceedances thereafter. So it suggests uh, that the legacy uh, issue is maybe less than uh, might have been thought. And that would be particularly, I suppose, with, with a lot of water going through the system at that time. So what generally anything that's there would be flushed out. Yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of hypotheses you can put around it. Uh, and I will emphasize again that I don't classify that piece of work as being scientifically robust, but it's an indicator. Okay, I, I suppose go, going back to and a couple of questions here about the nature of the uh, advisory uh, work done where you have seen uh, 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 impacts or, or reductions, uh, what approach was taken? You might just give us an idea of, of some of the interventions that were, were made in, the, in those catchments. Yeah, well, they come down to awareness raising. Um, and how do you do that? You do it through events that involve uh, those who are using the chemistry and taking the opportunity to communicate with them. We do know that if you um, organize an event which is solely uh, linked to pesticides and water, the attendance can be low. Um, it, the events need to be integrated into other uh, events or the discussions need to be integrated into other events where you have a, a farmer audience. I, we learned that actually from the UK where it was a rather uh, extensive program done in Wales. Um, and at one particular meeting that was organized with a significant lineup of speakers, there was no attendance. So it's important that uh, one finds the right channels to communicate. But everything else, newsletters, um, email communications, webinars, uh, talks, demonstrations, um, and demonstrations tend to, because of their practical nature, tend to attract uh, big audiences. I mean, we've had 150 people uh, of an evening in a field in, um, in uh, I think, in the Suck uh, Valley uh, at one stage. So they will attract uh, audiences. And once you have the audience, they're receptive and the messages can be disseminated. John, could I ask you about the, you know, the upcoming common agricultural policy? That's going to be, obviously, a, a major influence on farm practice over the next year. Uh, I suppose, uh, five, uh, seven years. Um, and what would, from your perspective, are there measures that you'd like to see in that next policy that address or to support uh, best practice that you've outlined here below? Or do you think it's 
it's something that uh, the industry, this TOPS program can continue on? Or I imagine there's, there's, there's opportunities there. Yeah, I think there are limitations on what we can do uh, and limitations on what we can do at TOPS. Uh, so we'll never get down to the level of, um, I suppose, one-to-one, if you look at that triangular model I showed, that would be able to um, disseminate the messages at that level. I think that uh, knowledge transfer is hugely important. Uh, I know we're at the end of the knowledge transfer program, uh, but I would certainly like to see that uh, integrated into the delivery of the next cap. Great. Uh, Question here in relation to, I suppose, most of the water sources that that, uh, um, you have referred to are um, surface water based. Uh, and just a few questions in relation to, to groundwater based sources and, and particularly, I suppose, has, has any monitoring been done in relation to wells that people are, are uh, that households are drinking from as opposed to group schemes? Yeah, well, first of all, say that all in terms of the public supplies, whether they come from surface water or groundwater, they're being monitored. Okay. Um, the group water schemes then are involved in monitoring and indeed we've worked with uh, some of them. And then you get to uh, the private sector. And I think there is a need for private wells to be uh, monitored and individuals who have private wells should consider uh, monitoring the water that's coming out of their um, taps. Okay, John, we're we're coming near the end of our uh, session today. Um, I just want to say thank you uh, to to, for you for taking the time to join us today. And I, I think that what you've covered there, I think there's there, it's a conversation that needs to be continued, certainly, um, especially, I suppose, the, the discussion around drinking water quality, but then there's, of course, the, the aquatic environment and the soil biome, and, and that work needs to continue, as, as you've rightly said there. So I think, uh, look, I think you've created a huge amount of awareness there about the issues and the work that's going on there, uh, the huge work that's going on there in collaboration with uh, the stakeholders. I think that's a really, uh, I think it's the, the only way really to, to progress these issues. So, so thanks again. Um, to everybody, just want to make you aware of a, a new service that we've, we're launching um, today. It is the, um, if you can see my screen, I'll just share it with you now. The new Signpost series podcast has just been uh, made available on Spotify, Google Play and Apple Podcasts. And in fact, it, it's a, a podcast version of the, uh, the, the webinars. Um, and so if you are not able to maybe make it along to the live session, you can catch up on this uh, series uh, through the, your, your podcast so you can listen to it wherever you normally pick up your pod- podcasts along the way. So you can access that through uh, Spotify, Google Play or Apple Podcasts, or you can go to the Chagas website and access them there. And of course, John's presentation uh, uh, and the recording of today's webinar will also be available on uh, our YouTube channel and the Chagas website also. So I uh, just want to say thank you for, for tuning in. I want to say thanks to our production team, Andy Boland, Yvonne Maher, and Pat Murphy. And we do hope you can join us next week for our next week's signpost webinar, where I think we're joined by John Finn. Is it Pass? Is John joining us next week? Um, I must uh, look, look up exactly who, who we have next week. It's worth, worth mentioning it, mentioning it but... Um, I think it is John Finn that's going to be joining us to talk about the work that they're doing on uh, multi-species grasslands down in uh, in Johnstown Castle. Am I right in that, Pat? I haven't looked, to be honest with you, uh, so apologies. Okay. I'm just looking it up here now. Yes, we do have John Finn. Multi-species mixtures increase yields and resilience to drought with lower nitrogen inputs. So uh, really looking forward to that uh, presentation next week. Okay, thanks everybody. And we will talk to you next week. Bye-bye.